I'm Mike Tirico. I work at Google as a data scientist. Um, I've kind of just had an amateur interest in linguistics for a long time is kind of how I got involved in um, learning a lot about translations and how they work. And Mike Lawrence is from our core. He is um, kind of in charge of maintaining translations for our core. I don't know if you want to add anything else. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll talk about like kind of the state of things for translations in R uh, as of today. Uh, and then we'll talk about kind of the mechanics of how translations work. Um, there's like the system from GetDex and how that works and how that interfaces with R. Uh, then we'll talk about some like common pitfalls and uh, how to actually do translation things that are common stumbling blocks in practice. And then we'll break out and start doing actual translations. So R has been supporting translation since about R 2.1, which is about 16 years ago, um, when Brian Ripley added integration with GetText to start doing translations for R. Uh, the first release had Japanese, Italian, and simplified Chinese. And as recently as 2021, Lithuania was added. And as of now, there's like 16 languages in various degrees of maintenance. Um, yeah, I could read them off, but I think you can get the idea. So R has a lot of a lot of messages. Um, probably the vast majority of them you will never see, or hopefully nobody ever sees. Uh, but um, yeah, so any error or message or verbose message warning that gets produced by any of R itself in its C code, in stats, in utils, any of the default packages. Um, any of those are kind of eligible for translation, and there are, as of today, about 5,500 of those. Um, and in the beginning, it was about 2,000, so it's grown by about 2x. Um, in just base alone, there's about 2,500 messages. That's like 1,900 C error messages and 600 from the R side. And stats has another 1,000 errors, like things you did wrong in running regressions. Yeah, so a quite substantial message base. Um, we, I got started on all this with translations in R doing um, translations for a data table. And data table is a, another pretty old package, pretty large package. And data table has about 1,400 messages. And R is like four times more than that. And the data table we did with a team of about 20 people. And it took about a month or two to get that done. So yeah, it's a pretty substantial undertaking to, to do a full translation set for all of R. Um, so yeah, how do translations work? I, I hope I'm not dating myself too much with this uh, Mario reference, but OK, you're playing Mario, you get the Bowser, uh, you throw him into the lava, and then, OK, the famous message, thank you, Mario, but our princess is in another castle. So if we were writing the code to do Mario from R, uh, how would we produce that? Uh, hopefully, it wouldn't be an error message, but OK. You might write, stop, thank you, Mara, but our princess is in another castle, and then more code to send you on to the next level to try and find the princess again. So two key like components here are the messaging function, which is stop, and then the message itself, which is this string, thank you, Mario, but our princess is in another castle. Um, there's like a small set of functions which are recognized by R as like producing messages for translation. Um, the three ones that you'll use almost all the time are stop, warning, and um, message. Those three, uh, by default, any string that appears in them literally would be, um, eligible, to be eligible to be extracted into a, a message for translation. Uh, and so what is stop actually doing is devolving things to this workhorse, which is get text. Um, get text is like really the workhorse behind all the translations. Uh, so stop under the hood calls get text, warning under the hood calls get text, message under the hood calls get text. Um, basically anything that is doing a translation, which is taking a string and producing it to the user in another language, will be calling the R function get text at some point. Um, if that's happening on the R side, and if on the C side also there's get text interfaces that look basically the same. Okay, so what is GetText doing? GetText is doing two things. Um, 
two things first is figuring out what the domain is. Domain is, you can think of it basically as being the language. Um, it's a little bit more technical term than that, but uh, for all intents right now, you can just think of it as a language. So um, the current R session, is it running in English? Is it running in Arabic? Is it running in Bahasa? Is it running in Japanese? Uh, what is the current domain in the current R session? Um, and where is this message being called from? So if it's being called from a package's namespace, it will look up the translations for that package. So uh, what do we mean by look up? Well, actually, after we figure out uh, which package we're in, what language we need to translate to, and which domain we're looking at, uh, we find the corresponding .mo file. We'll talk about what .mo is in a second. but Basically, in this .mo file, there are these correspondences between a message and its translation. And there are maybe a bunch of messages in here. I wrote another example message here, this flip over any of two cards and see if they match. It's another thing from Mario, if you remember. So within this .mo file, there's a bunch, basically, of messages and corresponding translations. And it's like a data structure, basically, that makes it easy and fast to uh, go from the input message ID to the output, what they call message string which is the translation. So, OK, we looked up this message ID, and we found the corresponding translation. Uh, please don't hold me to this Japanese translation. Um, actually, I was looking for the official Japanese translation of this um, Mario message, but apparently this game is so old that uh, they actually, in Japan, this message was in English, because writing these characters on a computer that old was too difficult. And enough people understand English in Japan that they just left it in English. So there's not actually an official translation of this into Japanese. Uh, so this .mo file is kind of how things are working in real time. Uh, in real time, we look up the .mo file, we look at the message, we get the translation. So where do we get these .mo files from? Uh, so we can kind of work backwards from the writing the code to getting the MO file. Uh, within your source code, you'll have these messaging functions, which I mentioned, like stop, warning, message. Um, then the other two that I haven't talked about yet are get text F, which is a way of doing templated translations. It's basically like Sprint F, but it's built for translation. And in fact, under the hood, get text F is really just running Sprint F on the output of get text. Uh, and then there's ngetText, which is used for plural translations. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, then we, as developers, would do an extraction, which is to extract all of these strings from our source code and put them into a template file, which is this .pot file. Uh, so we would extract a mistake, and it would come out as an, a message ID. We would extract be careful. It would come out as this message ID. We would extract percent the observations. It would come out as its own message ID. And then for plurals, they have their own slightly different syntax, which is uh, you get a message ID for the singular case, you get a message ID for the plural case, and then the output has these corresponding 0 and 1, which uh, for English, for example, this would correspond to the singular translation. This would correspond to the plural translation. Uh, in the pot file, this .pot template, the message stir is always empty, which is because this is just a template, it doesn't have an actual translation in it. Uh, so yeah, the, the, there is no translation in the template file. And then the next step is to uh, make translations. So we start from a .pot file and put translations in a corresponding .po file. So I made a crude attempt at doing a Portuguese translation here. So I think we have some actual Portuguese speakers here can call me out if uh, I'm totally wrong. But uh, we start from this template, write translations into uh, the .po file. So here, there is no translation. In the .po file, there is a translation. Um, so each message would get its own translation. Um, Portuguese is a very simple case, because Portuguese, uh, linguistically, does the same thing for pluralization that English does, which is that there's only two cases. There's either a singular case, which is corresponds to this first message, and the plural case, which is anything where the input 
doesn't have one. So even zero, uh, you would write like this. Okay. And then the last step is uh, using the getText tool to compile this .po file into a .mo file. And there's the tool to put it in the right place so that R can find it in runtime. So .po is something, a text file you could open in any um, text editor, you can open it in RStudio, you can open it in Atom, you can open it in Sublime, Emacs, anything. It's just a text file. This .mo file is a compiled thing, so if you open it, it's mostly gibberish. Um, and the messages themselves, too. So there's like a data structure here, basically, that uh, is the compiled version. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot, but that is the basic essential mechanics of how translations work. Um, so I will pause and take questions for a minute or two. Let that digest. This is the same also for packages, I think, or not? Yes, yeah, so base R itself has the same system, which is get text, um, as to uh, any packages you would add on, yeah. So the main difference for R itself is that the base package uh, has a little bit funny mechanics of where it finds files that it wants that uh, you get translations from. Um, yeah. So for packages, of course, all of the R messages you would just get from the R directory, all of the C and C++ messages you would get from the SRC directory. But for base itself, the directory structure of R devel is uh, quite different. I don't know how many people are that familiar with uh, how R devel is structured, but it, that's not that important. But basically, that uh, there are C files that are not just in the SRC directory under base. So um, there are messages pulled from a bunch of different places. But the mechanics are the same. I mean, the mechanics are the messages in C are marked in a certain way and pulled into this .pot template file. Um, once you have the template file, everything falls the same from that. For the strings, uh, for the templated uh, strings, uh, does one need to use Sprint uh, F or could you use something like glue that's also kind of templated after a certain fashion? Yeah, so um, I think I'm still kind of working out how to do extensions of translations to like more modern ways of building strings. Um, in principle, what you need is to just pass um, a literal string to glue to get it translated first. And then glue can apply the um, evaluation part and then proceed from there. Uh, so if you had something that is taking the input to, to glue and extracting that into a .pot file, then it could be translated and then passed on to glue. Glue does the evaluation and things can proceed. Um, as of now, it's a bit difficult to get that to work. Um, you basically would have to write a couple wrapper functions that it would be a wrapper function that says, um, this string gets passed on to glue, translated, and then evaluated. Um, but yeah, so in base R, of course, it's not using it glue, so we don't have to worry about that too much today. But yeah, for uh, doing this on your own package, you would, I think, basically want to write a wrapper function that um, you might call it like glue F or glue translated or something that basically in your source code, you're using this wrapper function. And the wrapper function uh, in your source code has uh, the strings that you want to be translated. Um, and then my, I have the package that would be able to uh, look for in your package those um, strings that are being sent to custom functions and extracted to the pot template. So I don't think I explained it super well, but uh, the the idea is it's a bit complicated, but doable. Uh, and you kind of have to be careful about, um, because what's going to happen is 
you're going to have the string. Uh, it's going to be translated, and then glue is going to act on it. So if between the if the translation breaks the evaluatability of that uh, message, then glue is going to kind of error on it. But yeah, I think it's doable. Uh, it's something that um, hopefully we can work out together uh, in the future. Yeah, I think it's doable. It's something that I'm starting to look into now, but uh, haven't actually done it in practice. Yeah, it's, it's interesting Thanks. to think about that uh, just because uh, I mean, my understanding is with glue, you know, you're referencing symbols in your code from that message. Uh, in that case, uh, you know, if you were to change this, that symbol name, then you're probably going to have to update all the translations. Is that right? Yeah, I think this, I think so. But I think it's kind of the same for SPRINF too, right? Well, for Where S if something changes from a... It's just uh, true. S, right? Yeah, so it's, it's more serious, I think, for glue, but something similar can happen in SprintF where if, if you change the type from a integer to a, a string, then the message template will have to update. Um, but yeah, I think it's more common to like rename variables and refactor code. The message is basically the same, but the internal variable name changes. Right. Um, and then that will break your translation. You'll have to re redo the translation, but hopefully the maintenance burden of that burdens of that is not too high because you would just copy and paste the thing inside the purely braces into the new translation. Um, but yeah, it would definitely break the old translation. Actually, I've been using glue with PO files, mm -hmm. and it has been much more convenient compared to sprintf because with sprintf you have references to some variables by index, and when you are switching the index in a in a language, then it will just mess up the translation altogether. While if you are using glue, then Although you have to ask your translators to keep the English variable names, but you can switch the order of the variables as uh, they think mm. it, it looks better in a given language. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so we'll, we'll talk about that. I think what Gurgle is talking about, we'll talk about in a couple minutes. But yeah, there's there's this very ugly thing that you have to do with uh, Sprintf um, when you want to change the orders, when it's much more natural in many languages to write the message in a different order. The way that you have to handle that in SprintF is quite ugly, but if for glue, it would just be a matter of writing the variable name in a different place. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess another advantage would be that when you're, you're going through the translations and you're just looking at the message strings, it might be more obvious or more self-descriptive of what mm -hmm. is actually going to go into that percent %s, right? And that, that might help you, you know, translate it, right? Assuming the yeah, variable names exactly. are you know, formatively yeah. named. Yeah. Which is another thing we'll talk about in a bit of like, sometimes it's a bit hard to reconstruct the context of what the message is without having to go back to the source code. Um, and it becomes a bit more self-documenting in the pot file itself when you're using glue. Yeah, so I wonder, well, one question I've been kind of wondering about, I um, you know, never tried tra translating myself, but it, it seems like there'd be situations that would arise where uh, when using Asperna for glue, uh, you're substituting in a word at runtime that word could be, uh, like in some languages, a noun could have a gender or something, right? It could have mm -hmm. something about it that affects the other surrounding terms. Like, you know, this is a bad mm -hmm. argument, uh, but, you know, mm -hmm. argument might be substituted out for a, a noun of a different gender, and now bad might need to be, you know, formed differently. But does that ever arise, and, and how would you handle that? I mean, is there a better way for us to write error messages in you know, in, the, in, in English, so that doesn't, that those cases don't come up. Like, that would mm. be interesting to know. Yeah, I think um, what I've run into here so far is that what you want to plug into the template parts of a SprintF message are not English words. Like, you basically want to avoid putting in English words to that. Um, because if you do that, you end up, I mean, even gender, not gender is not the only thing, but like case and the arrangement of the words might just change if you're putting words in there. So if you're putting only like variable names or function names, um, that kind of thing uh, inside the template, that makes it, I think, more translatable. Right. It's like almost like it should just be something that is part of the data, you know, something that would be relevant only to the user and the user would understand whatever it is, right? Like it's something from, from that, you know, whatever data set they're using or the context in which they're working, right? Yeah. Any, any, any other sort of trickery you can imagine 
mention people being trying to be clever, you know, like trying to, you know, they, they don't want to, you know, they're conditioning on something and they don't want to write the message out twice. So they, they, they yep. try to be clever and, and, and all of a sudden that, that breaks translations. Right? Yep. So, yeah. Oh, I, we actually have a PR and data table right now that, uh, someone has already done that. And, uh, they've basically taken a couple of, there's like three or four different, there's like maybe 15 total combinatorial error messages that can happen, but it's from like three or five components. And they say, okay, take component one, paste component two, take component one, paste component three, um, based on what the actual error is. But when it comes to translation, that becomes, uh, much tougher. All right, cool. Thanks. Yeah. So, all right, let's, uh, we can continue now, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. So that's kind of the mechanics of how it works. Uh, so you've done translations now what happens? So now we talk about how to maintain translations over time. Um, so there's kind of three basic things that happen with translations over time. Uh, new error messages get added. That's like new code gets added, or you found a bug and you need to, uh, stop another edge case. So you add a new error message, um, an old message is removed, either you deprecated code or you refactored code. Um, or maybe even you switch the code from being an R to being in C. And so a message disappears from the, that R pot file and adds up, ends up in the, the C pot file. Um, and then messages get changed. Uh, hopefully they change. Hopefully the messages obviously are super instructive and informative and everybody that ever experiences that error messages knows exactly what happened, but obviously we're uh, quite far from that ideal. Uh, so as we get like user feedback over time, we think of ways to improve error messages, uh, either they get changed or refactored. Um, maybe there's a typo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The messages change just slightly. So the pod file is always just extracted directly from the source code. The pod file is super easy to change because you just overwrite the old one. But the .po file is less so because you don't want to just erase all the old translations. Ideally, you keep all the translations that say the same and figure out what to do about the deltas that happened here. So for new messages, again, it's pretty easy. You can just like cat the new message ID into the .po file. Uh, just put it in there. It should be easy to just insert. Uh, remove messages. Uh, well, maybe it didn't get removed or it just got moved to a, a slightly different place and the old translation is still useful. Um, but it just doesn't fit exactly into the, the new thing. So they don't just delete the old translations, which might like throw some uh, knowledge away. They get marked as deprecated, which means that they show up in the .po file like this. They have, they're basically commented out with the tilde to mark them as deprecated. So this is from the actual, uh, r.po file for Chinese right now. This is a message that at some point was appearing in R and it no longer does. So somebody went to the effort of translating this in case it is still useful to the translators uh, in the future. This is left there at the bottom of the file. Uh, the next case is kind of edited messages. These are kind of marked as fuzzy is what they call it. So if an error changes slightly, um, they get, they don't throw them away totally. They, uh, get text tries to find a close match. Um, I'm, still quite puzzled about what exactly uh, the algorithm is for finding that match because it doesn't seem to be too great. But uh, yeah, so they look for close error messages. And if one is close, it's found, they will kind of try and merge the old message with the new, the old translation with the new message uh, and mark it as fuzzy. So you can, uh, as you update your translations, you can look for fuzzy ones and make sure they're okay or kind of update them slightly to, to match the new error message. So here's another one that's marked as fuzzy in Chinese. Um, I think uh, probably you can't understand very well, but this actually does say, uh, this part says should be numeric, um, but it seems the argument that this message is for, the actual argument name tolerance is no longer tolerance, it's now X. So this has changed slightly. We would just have to change tolerance to X, and now this is a valid translation again. So the idea of fuzzy translations is to make it slightly easier on you by associating old translations where the work is already done to like close matches in the new translations to try and minimize the burden of updating. Quick, quick, quick clarifying question on that on the previous. Sorry, just uh, yeah. The message ID is what the current uh, message is. 
right? So the message has been updated yeah. to the message ID. And so the message yeah. string is what has to be updated. So X changed the tolerance. Is that what has to happen there or? Yeah, sorry. So yeah, exactly. X needs to change the tolerance here. So exactly. So when it comes to a fuzzy message that you see in a .po file, the message ID is correct. And the message, ID, message string might be wrong. So the message ID is always like reflected currently in the .pot file and the message term might need to be updated. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for helping to clarify. So, uh, can I ask another question? Yeah, sure, of course. This? So, uh, uh, the, the idea is at some point in the past, there was a message ID which read X should be numeric, right? Or? Yeah, exactly. So the old message ID, and, and now the, that message ID is still on the code on, on somewhere, but like deprecated, or is it, uh, so when a fast image is find, found, and then it's completely uh, uh, removed, overwrite. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I think I understand what you're saying, so let me let me clarify. But I, I'm not 100% sure um, that it gets marked as deprecated. I think that instead of being marked as deprecated, it gets marked as fuzzy. So it either continues to exist, it gets marked as deprecated, or it gets marked as fuzzy. I think there, there are three options there. So what that would mean is that this X should be numeric message has disappeared from the, the database. Um, and because it disappeared, they looked for a close match in untranslated messages uh, that still remained. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. It seems odd that such a common looking message might have disappeared, but uh, who knows, maybe it wound up in C or they added a period or yeah, it could have changed uh, in any number of ways. But yeah, the X should be numeric is no longer there. Does that help? Does that help? Yeah, it, it's just kind of weird that then you're basically losing the old translation. If the fast match, match uh, was wrong, <laughs> then you are kind of overwriting something else or maybe yeah i don't know it doesn't sound like i'm such a good idea I, like, perhaps add, add it add it uh, to the bottom uh, and keep the old one but okay that's yeah i wonder i think there is. might be an option in get text to just shut off fuzzy matching and only mark old translations as deprecated um it, it makes sense to me that such an option exists, but I'm not perfectly familiar with the man page to say that it does for sure. Because um, these uh, automatic checks of fuzzy or removing, who does it? Mm. There's an automatic tool that um, yeah. checks this. Yeah, so there's a, the, the tool is called MSG Merge. I, I'll try and just type that here. Um, G Merge. Uh, MSG merge, and this is like uh, part of the get text toolkit. Um, and what message merge does is take an existing PO file and try and merge it against a uh, updated POT file. Um, and presumably there's a ton of options associated with that. I think one of which is probably helping to dictate how to do matching of new messages. Okay, thanks. Yeah, there's a no fuzzy matching flag. Perfect. Yeah, so oh, okay. that would probably be more to Elio's uh, preference would just be, don't even try to do fuzzy matching, just throw it to the bottom of the file. Um, and I'll kind of sift through that myself and keep those in mind. Um, I haven't uh, worked in extensively enough with this, but in my, in my Pro Tools package, I tried to say uh, deprecated messages at the start of translation, just like spit them out um, to the translator. Uh, so that they're kind of surfaced to you before you start, so you know what's kind of available to you. And then if a message is marked as translated as you're translating, um, they'll kind of be put side by side and say, like, this previously translated as something like this, maybe you just want to copy paste. Um, yeah. So Mike, maybe I should know this, but does is message merge executed as part of the, you know, the make PO, you know, step that we do to, to update every messages every, every R release? I don't know about the make file, but I know it's part of update package PO, which is the tools right. workhorse behind that's, that's what I meant, Right. So we, we yeah. run that. Yes, yeah, so we run that via make and then it so it does do a message merge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. So I don't know there. when exactly does it. It should be after the POT updates, and then it right. should do message merge for the old .po files that right. exist already. Yeah, right. So it's something where, yeah, this this is going to be introduced, you know, <laughs> whether whether the translators like it or not, these fuzzy messages will be introduced when we update the messages. So all yeah. the more important to have people, you know, look at things before release to make sure things are good. Yep. Cool. Yeah, maybe maybe it's a discussion to have whether uh, R itself should add the no no fuzzy messages flag. But uh, so far, I guess we haven't heard any complaints too much from it. But uh, also, the like for example, the Spanish messages haven't been updated in ten years, so maybe uh, it's one of these things that would just make it easier for people. There's, there's definitely some lower hanging fruit there, yeah, in terms of the mm. translations. Yeah. Speaking about uh, well, not updated for ten years. Uh, do you folks happen to know what happened to the Poodle, or I'm not sure how to pronounce that, the service, so that you could have edited PO files uh, as part of uh, as a web service at translation.rproject.org, which was live like 10 years ago, but it's not accessible anymore. That's, that's the first time I've heard of this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> really? I, okay. If Mike, if Mike Allen never heard of it, then yeah. Yeah. Maybe Brian had some server doing this at some that's point. That's right. Yeah, he must have had something set up. Yeah. But and that's exactly the kind of thing that, uh, you know, uh, Mike's, uh, our working group that we're starting up is going to be looking into, uh, so, you know, figuring out how can we streamline uh, you know, the translation submission process and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll follow up with you about what the experience was like, uh, Gregory, with that. That'd be great to learn about them. Oh, cool. Let me just write that down quickly so I don't lose it from the chat. I can also share that later. I just remember that there was this service running 10 years ago, but uh, I was checking on that yesterday and it's, it's, it's gone. Hmm. Okay, uh, I will continue again, okay? Um, yeah, so we talked about how to how the maintenance burden of translations looks like. Um, so now a couple more details about um, locales and domains. Um, yeah, most domains are two-letter ISO codes. Um, you may be, I guess, by now familiar if you've used your um, native language on your computer enough with what your own code is. Um, Indonesian, for example, is ID. Turkish is TR. Uh, now, they also have um, dialects and basically how to handle dialects for translation. Uh, the most common case for this that I've come across is usually for um, Chinese, which Chinese, is, you may be familiar, has simplified and traditional. So the way that they usually do that in translation systems is to do simplified Chinese as DHCN, which is really like mainland Chinese, which is where they use simplified the most. And then ZHTW is for Chinese in Taiwan, which is where they have traditional Chinese the most. Um, presumably, there could also be like a ZHTK or a HK, which would be like Hong Kong Chinese, which would also be traditional Chinese. But I think the dialect is substantially different there. So uh, maybe the messages would actually look up different. But for now, I've only ever seen this be like simplified versus traditional. Um, and simplified is ZHCN and traditional is ZHTW. Um, some of the other like huge diasporic languages in the world would be more common to see actual dialects like Spanish. There's Spanish for Argentina, which is ESAR. There's Spanish for Dominican Republic, which is ESDO. Spanish for Spain is ESES. Um, and then Arabic too has a ton of dialects. So Arabic also has like the Tunisian, um, Tunisian subdomain. There's one for Saudi Arabia, one for, um, one for Syria. Yeah, so the, those huge diasporic languages have um, some scope to do um, dialect translations as well. So I think we'll talk about how that actually works. So suppose you are in Argentina running in ESAR, um, which message actually gets shown to you? So when you hit the stop message, you're not supposed to be here, you've done something wrong. What's going to happen is first, it will get looked up in the specific R-E-S-A-R.mo file, 
which is the one most specific to your current session. Uh, and if there's no translation for that message in the esar.mo file, we go to the less specific version, which is just general es.mo. Uh, and if there's none found there, then it just ends up untranslated. So whatever the original message was written in the source code, it will get reproduced to you, uh, which for the vast majority of cases, that will just be in English. But there's, in principle, nothing stopping you from writing all of your messages, say, in German in your source code. Uh, and then the German message would be reproduced here. Um, that's basically how it works. There's a lot more complication there that I don't think 99.9% .9 of people use, but that's the basic idea of how things work. Um, R itself is using that to do uh, British and American English um, split. So anytime that there's an English like a uh, spelling or um, certain, I guess there's a couple of dialect things, but it's mainly about spelling like gray and favor. Uh, there's an ENGB MO file and uh, things get looked up there first. And if not, it just returns the general English uh, translation. And then lastly, this is just uh, why there's multiple .pot files that we'll come across that we'll start seeing soon. Um, basically, it gets split by where the message came from um, because the tooling for how to create that .pot file um, is different in the first place. So uh, there's one that corresponds to the R files and one that corresponds to the, the C files. I think we talked about this a little bit already, so I won't go over it again. OK, another pause for questions in case any have accumulated. Are those files? <laughs> because I'm just trying to look for them in the in the source code. I, I downloaded from SVN and um, yeah, yeah. Let me try I, and share a different tab. I Okay, so I'm just going to browse on GitHub real quick. Uh, so the .po and .pot files are in search library .po, and they're all here. Yeah. So here is Farsi, for example. Here's Brazilian Portuguese. The .pot file is r-base.pot, and then the, for the C translations for base, it's called r.pot. And then all of the default packages have their own .po directory, so like stats. Here's stats.po. There's rstats.pot. And then there's stats.pot. And then when you, this is going to be the fun part. OK. Uh, let me see if I can share. Uh, I can stop that. I think it's probably too small for you guys, huh? Can you actually see? Can you see that now? No, it's better. Uh, Much better. Yeah. All right. So let's see if this actually works. OK. So yeah, this is my work from here. So you're seeing uh, we use our Google. Uh, So on your actual R session, uh, it's in this library translations directory that they end up in. 
Uh, these would be all the MO files. So yeah, so on the actual running R, here's all the .mo files that come for all the default packages. Okay. Any other questions? Yay, I found I found a fussy fussy one. <laughs> Which one? A fast uh, one of the fussy uh, Ah yes. Uh, yes. No non deprecating ones. Okay. I will continue. So yeah, so that's kind of the mechanics of translation. That's like, as a developer, um, how to think about translations. Um, ideally, as like a translator, a lot of that friction would go away. Um, that's kind of my goal for the Tools package, to try and get rid of a lot of that knowledge that uh, it's like a lot to know all this, dot, all this get tech stuff, which uh, if you just want to translate stuff, is a bit of a lot of overhead in, in my opinion. Um, so focusing on translation itself, there's still a whole nother like set of kind of institutional knowledge things to try and um, start thinking about for how to make translation easier, how to make translation work better. Um, so first, well, we'll just go over a couple of things. Um, there's a lot more, of course, but just like the, the, a couple of big things that um, I've certainly come across. Um, one, is template translations, like for SprintF, we kind of talked about this before. Um, you would see a message, this is a message from R, percent %D, which means a number, an integer, arguments passed to internal percent %S. This is going to be a string, which is going to name some internal function, which requires percent %D. So this, you ran into an error where you tried to pass internal, some internal function, the wrong number of arguments. Um, the translation that you do for this, uh, it's going to have to have a percent %D, a percent %S, and a percent %D in that order. Or if you have to rearrange them, which happens in a lot of languages that just have different syntactical structures than English, uh, you would have to number the inputs. So here is how this actually looks in the Chinese translation for this message. Uh, we see that internal is still getting past the string, and it's the second input, so that $2 s, that's what this $2 means. The first input is still a digit. This $1 is saying that this is the first input, and then $3 is saying that it's the third input. So this is kind of what we were talking about with Gregory before, where the glue version of this, it would just be brace, like internal name, brace, uh, received arguments, brace, uh, required arguments. And you can just rearrange those templates within the um, translated string. But for sprintf, you have to bring along these $2, $1, and refer to the argument order um, as they would be received in the code itself. So there's like this extra overhead of um, trying to keep track of the order of uh, inputs as you translate into a more natural order in your language. I, I guess that yeah. if you're using the, the glue idea, the, the problem there could be that you lose the, if, the, if it's an integer or, or a number or, or a string, which could be useful mm -hmm. information. Um, so I think the idea is that the glue version is referring to a variable, and as the type of the variable changes, the um, the behavior of glue kind of dictates whether the change happens or not. So it's kind of independent of translation. Um, so yeah, you don't have to keep track in glue of what type the variable is. Kind of glue does that for you, yes. and whether the glue executes correctly or not. Um, yeah, here it's like two yeah. things you have to keep track of when you're doing that. Which is both the types of the variables and the order. 
Yeah, but, but uh, as for translators, may, maybe knowing, for example, if you get this string and it says brace arguments and brace arguments pass two, you don't know if that's like a, a string of, of with the name of the arguments of the or, or the number of arguments, which might be mm. important for translating. Mm. I think you need to provide some comments for the translators anyway, mm -hmm. if it's a complex message to be translated. Uh, at least that has mm -hmm. been my experience. It's really great to use uh, self-explaining variable names, but at some point that's just not enough. And GetX provides ways to pass comments for the translators mm -hmm. with the hash dot prefix, which is, I think, really, really useful in such cases. Mm. Yeah, that's something that the R tooling like doesn't have access to at all right now is those context specifiers. Um, yeah, that's something I think would be nice to start integrating um, into R and is figuring out how to make it work to pull along these comments to show up not just in the source code, uh, but also in the .dot template um, if you want to leave a context clue for your translator. Um, yeah, so that's something that's in the GetText tooling, but it is not integrated yet um, with R itself. Good question, uh, Mike, for the uh, templated strings here. Uh, you showed the example where kind of the order, the order of, of, of things changes because of Chinese syntax. Um, mm -hmm. Would one have to kind of use these, like, um, uh, index prefixes, if I can put it that way, in the, let's see, uh, original language, uh, or, or is it simply sufficient in any translation that changes the order of appearance of, of the arguments that you, you use these kind of um, indexed prefixes? Yeah, so uh, there's a couple things. Um, one, like you can get away with just completely ignoring what the translator has to do here. And yeah, so this is perfectly valid, like no, I call them redirects, these $1, $2. Um, no redirects at all in the original um, message. And then only the translators have to worry about uh, what the order is. Um, two, like technically you could just write $1 D, $2 S, $3 D. Like that's perfectly valid R code and S per def code. Um, and I had no idea about this until quite recently, but sometimes it can be quite useful if when you're running sprintf, if you want to reuse the input, instead of writing like comma s, comma s, comma s, you just write dollar one s, dollar one s, dollar one s in your actual code and uh, reuse it. So the the redirects are valid in the original translations, um, but yeah, I, it's very atypical. I don't I don't think R uses that a single time in the source code, if I remember correctly. So it's it's quite uncommon to actually do that in the Eng English code. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if it would even help the translators to do it. Okay, are we all on the same page? So next is uh, plural translations. Um, I'm not sure how common it is to use and get text in the first place, but it is there. Um, yeah, so here's an example. There is no package called versus there are no packages called. So this is an error R produces when you try and load packages that don't exist. Um, depending on how many packages that don't exist you tried to load. Uh, if you only tried to load one, they would say there is no and n would be one. Um, there are no n would be any number other than one. Uh, and you would put that here, and that would show up as message two. Um, we talked a little bit about how that shows up in English, and this would be um, the message shares for the .pot file. But for translations, uh, lots of languages have lots of different approaches to pluralization. The ones that I know, um, the languages that I like more or less am familiar with, uh, are all like English or like East Asian languages, which East Asian languages have no plural really. So. Uh, there's this metadata about um, meta parameter about languages that kind of dictates what the pluralization structure is for um, different languages. Um, and for the East Asian languages, it would be only one message here. 
So regardless of what the number of packages is that were tried to be evaluated, the translation would be the same because there's just no real concept of pluralization in like Chinese or Japanese. Um, and in all of like the Romance languages, um, Spanish, Portuguese, English, they all use the same basic pluralization structure where it's either singular or it's not. But there are other languages which are like much more complicated and like mind-blowingly complicated. Like uh, Arabic, there are six different ways that you can get um, pluralization. Uh, I'm not sure if our Arabic speakers, how cognizant are, they are even of that being the case or if it's just something that's supernatural to them um, that as you speak, you, you do this pluralization without even thinking about it. Um, I think Polish also has five different ways of doing it. Um, yeah, so there's a basically a parameter, and well, I can show that to you later, but uh, it would dictate based on what N is, which pluralization um, to use. And they would kind of go in order, and uh, you just have to know when N equals this, it corresponds to this message based on what index uh, this parameter evaluates to. Yeah, I can talk about that more later with the people for whom that uh, that pluralization is more complicated for their language. Which I think would only be Arabic on this call. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's a, maybe I can just show this. Um, for example, I think we're doing good on time, so I'll just uh, take a pause to show this quickly. So GNOME is uh, one of the Linux distributions. They have a really good um, ecosystem for translation going on. Um, I refer to this site all the time. But their Arabic team shows some stats about uh, how translation works. And then at the bottom here, you see this really complicated. Uh, this formula dictates how translation or how pluralization works in Arabic. So there are six plurals. and uh, you apply this arithmetic to the input n, and whatever the output is, that's the corresponding number uh, index you use for the translation. Uh, yeah, so compare that to uh, English, for example, where it's as simple as like n not equal to 1. Right? So it's very, very straightforward. Um, so a couple more things like um, special characters, um, new lines, if the, the message ID, which is the translated message, if it starts with a new line, the translation has to start with a new line. If it ends with a new line, the translation has to end with a new line. Um, new lines in the middle, I think you can kind of do whatever you want with. I, they don't even have to match in number, although they probably should. Um, tabs, you can do whatever you want. They don't seem to care whether you match tabs or not. And certain other things like a uh, 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 carriage return, this like vertical tab, these things I think aren't allowed in translated strings to begin with. So you shouldn't have to come across that. But uh, if you're trying to translate a package and want to mark a message with an R for translation, it's not going to work. Um, yeah, punctuation. All languages have like uh, different kind of uh, slightly similar punctuation or different ways of quoting or different ways of brackets. Um, you can kind of just make whatever. I mean, at the end of the day, the translations that you're doing are kind of communicating to your users. So whatever you think would be most natural to them, uh, use that. Try and be consistent. I think that is uh, tougher to do. Um, and if you're going to use the ASCII double quote, you have to escape it. This is just to call out um, if you're not super familiar with like C or Python and the ability to kind of concatenate strings across lines by just writing quotes. Um, that's how it works in the .pot files and .po files as well. That uh, as long as you keep writing the, the quotes line after line, it'll all be considered one message ID. So here, um, everything between quotes on all these lines will get concatenated um, with no spaces directly, and it'll just be one string. So this is the way that they make it so that the there's not like massive strings, um, dozens of uh, pages wide on a single line. 
Um, this is the longest message in the whole R database, which is one that I think we're all familiar with. This is the one that shows up when you first launch R. Um, and it's like scary to say to people, I think. Uh, here, it, it GetX also truncates messages at each new line. So every time there's a new line, it'll wrap it to a new line. Um, coming to like technical terms, like like mean as a statistical concept and like namespace as a computing concept, um, these things often you can just leave it untranslated if it's technical enough. Um, but if you do want to translate it, there is a, a glossary of technical and statistical terms here that is referenced by the RP, um, R translation manual. Uh, my go-to is to go to Wikipedia and okay, we find the Wikipedia page for namespace. We go to the other languages and see if it's translated into our own language and just copy and paste from there. Um, one thing that I, uh, the, the data table team that was used, did that was useful is um, start of a glossary. Um, basically, if you're translating as a, a group of people, you have a, a reference list of translations for more technical things that as you come across them, you kind of agree what the translation is and just mark it down and refer to it back, refer back to it. In the future. Uh, now, so as you're doing translation, what, what's going to happen is you're just going to be in the .pot file and there's going to be a string and you might have no idea what the string is talking about because there's these template things. Um, you have no idea of what is trying to be communicated. So how do we try and return that context? Um, Gurgly mentioned that GetText does come with a way to try and provide hints to users, but that uh, R is not equipped for that yet. So these things are kind of just like in the void strings that you have to figure out how to translate. Um, this is not a great example because it's kind of clear, but you can find any number of strings within the .pot um, for R that are like, I have no idea what this is talking about. So how do we figure out what that context is? Uh, we do get these slash colons that show us where in the source this message came from. So if we go to this file on line 826, we will find this uh, error message or uh, warning, it looks like an error message. And this error message is repeated a bunch of times. So it'll also show up at source main util.c line 859. It'll show up at search slash main slash util.c line 900 and all these other ones. So uh, this message is used a bunch of different times, and we can try and go back to the source code and find out uh, what the context was that this was used in from reading the source code. Hopefully, that's helpful. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Do you know if there are any, I mean, editors or IDEs that would make it really easy to jump to that place in the file from the the po file or pop file? Maybe. So I know that uh, Emacs has a .po mode. Um, I have not been able to figure out how to get it to work yet because I'm very, very weak at Emacs to begin with. Um, so it might work with Emacs, although whatever the tool was would have to know where this is. This file name is relative to, right? Um, which this file is going to be within search library uh, base po directory, and this is this SRC is relative to the top level directory of R, so it's not relatively correct. Um, so we'd have to have a bit more context to that tool to know what this file name is relative to. Um, and the translation guide for R also mentions, um, I have to look it up real quick. Uh, it mentions another um, tool that I'm, it might have that functionality, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, what's it called? Yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was thinking maybe, uh... Maybe, maybe later on as part of this working group or whatever, we could convince our studio to uh, kind of hard code some conveniences into this. So to enable facilitate translation, you know, finding the context of the code. Kbabel, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Kbabel, but uh, that's the other one. That's the other tool mentioned in the R translations guide, um, which might help, but I, I, I don't know. I haven't used either of them very successfully. so. Cool. Yeah, for me, when I'm doing this, I just have uh, Adam open with the the directory and uh, just poke around in the 
it's the source tree, which is usually not too hard to find, but um, it would be nice to be, because these line, these files are huge, right? So like getting to line 900 is also kind of like a scroll, scroll, scroll thing. Yeah. Mike, is there, is there any way to kind of embed um, like a, a comments in here? Uh, I mean, I guess presumably the way the PO files, the POT file is generated, probably not, but I mean, is there, like if you, if you could leave for posterity, like a comment about, you know, some of the context of a, of a comment that might aid in translation in future. Yeah, I think Gurgly is, is actually quite familiar with this. He said he's used this before. Um, Get text itself is equipped to do this. I'm, it's not something that I think R is natively aware of in its build system yet. I, so I don't know if you wrote those now, those comments, whether they would be erased by the current build system um, for R. But in principle, get text has that functionality. I, I just don't know uh, if R is equipped to be able to handle that. And it's, I think maybe that's something we should invest in um, going forward, but it's certainly available. Is it, is, it, is it something that's embedded in the string itself? Like some kind of comment that you embed in the string? No, I, I, I think maybe Gurgly should talk about this, because I'm also only vaguely familiar. So yeah, we'll ask Gurgly. Yeah, so in the tools package, there's the X get text function, which is used, I think, uh, even in Bazaar to extract all the strings to be translated, and those are uh, put together into a POT file. And uh, this function doesn't have the option to look up comments. And what I did for some of my packages is that I patched the X get text function so that it not only extracts the string to be translated, but the function which has a string to be translated like stop, message, or warning. It has mm -hmm. another argument, which can be a comment for the translator, and it's extracting that and putting to the POT file. So currently, it's an ugly hack, and I hope there could be much better ways to solve this issue. And the best way to do that would be probably to do that in the tools package. Okay. So it would require a change to, to the extraction. So we'd be pulling out, say, comments yeah. Yeah. above the, the call to get to get text or something yeah. like that. Yeah, one can imagine like another um, like R oxygen type comment markup um, that gets recognized as translation comments. And uh, if they're next to uh, a warning or stop call, they get associated to it and extracted with the tool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess ultimately we should be writing code that is so clear that, you know, <laughs> it would be best to just read the code, right? I mean, that's, that, as, as coders, that's what we're trying to do. Um, you know, comments end up, you know, creating cruft, as everybody knows, right? As you, as the, the comment in the code gets out of sync. So I think ideally, I figure out a way to, to communicate, you know, to get people so they can pop into the code and having the code be obvious enough as to what it's doing. That would be the ideal. But, well, yeah, we're probably a little bit. Yeah, I'll say with um, with data table, we had like fourteen hundred messages, and there were maybe ten to twenty of them where the translators were like, "I have no idea what this is," and then they told me, and I was like, "I also have no idea what this is," which you know it goes back to maybe we need to refactor the code itself to be better. So uh, yeah, that's like another side benefit, by the way, of of doing translations is that this interplay with like thinking about your error message database as being something you need to um, actively translate actually improves your messages by feeding back to say, well, this was a terrible message in the first place. Uh, we should improve the English version of this before we can even translate it. Uh, it needs to be better in the first place. Yeah, yeah. and there, and there have been translators uh, who have done that in the past, and it's actually been really helpful. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I just want to encourage everybody, you know, as you're contributing these things, like feedback is very welcome. You know, if you think that uh, you don't really understand what something means in English or you're not even sure if the, the message is, is even being emitted properly, I mean, those, those types of things, we can catch those. And yeah, it'd be great. Yeah. And I, one more comment uh, that I had was that the Po Tools goes slightly towards this direction. Um, already by what I do is I find the message as it was, and instead of just the string, I at least include the whole call that in, uh, that produced the string. So it would include the stop or the warning or the end got text for the R side. And on the, the C side, it would include, so you get to see all the arguments as well um, for the templated strings. Um, it helps a little bit, but it, it certainly would be better to just go like click and 
jump to the full source code immediately. Okay. Um, where are we? Yeah, and the, just one more way to find the context uh, is to just use grep for the source code. Sometimes that helps too, um, especially on the R side. Uh, okay, so how do we actually, so Given that these, these, there's these constraints like the templates have to match and you have to make sure you uh, escape your double quotes and match your new lines, uh, it just creeps in sometimes that you have these mistakes or you missed a certain template or you switch to a different keyboard and the percent sign was not the UT, the ASCII percent sign and it was the percent sign in another language and now the format didn't get recognized because you typed the Chinese percent sign and you went back to English and now it doesn't get recognized. These kind of things just kind of creep in. So one way to check validity is with uh, this command line tool, MSG FMT, which is message format. Um, this is the tool that's used to create .mo files, but you can kind of just uh, throw away the output and just run it um, and it will give you errors if there are any. Hey, Mike. I, um, yeah. Are you advancing the slide? I'm, I'm still seeing the one about the grep. Oh. Uh, Maybe if you went back into presentation mode, like you're. Yeah. Um, let me like force refresh and. Uh... Okay. Are we seeing the message format slide? Still the same. AP, you're sharing the other window. Yeah, maybe no. I need to just stop sharing. Different tab, okay. I think. Okay, I think I had more than one tab open. Classic. Okay. Hopefully we can see it now. So yeah, hopefully it's uh, showing message format. Can you guys see that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, just to show an example invocation of message format, um, you this dash C gives you um, better feedback. You Your input is this .po file. And I just set the output to be centered out to throw it to your terminal. Um, but yeah, that'll just be throwaway, and hopefully there's no uh, no errors. Uh, so if you want to actually get the messages to appear in an R session, uh, that's a lot more involved. Um, you certainly, if you have uh, the SVN copy of Ardevel, uh, you would be able to just build like normally, and hopefully it would uh, show up just like that. Um, If, yeah, you have to have the, the .po file in the right place in the, the R source directory, but once it's in there, it should install correctly. Um, my way to get the right language to appear is just to set the language um, environment variable temporarily before starting R. This is different on Windows. I haven't been able to find a consistent and sticky way to make this work on Windows, but the basic idea is the same that um, the language controls it, but I, I have no luck on Windows um, getting that to work. So I'm, I'm sorry, I just have not enough familiarity with Windows for how translations work. You know, the testing piece I'll just mention, uh, you know, make sure that you that you take advantage of this this uh, utility and, uh, and test the translations prior to, uh, to submitting them because otherwise there'll just be a lot of back and forth as, as I try to get things mm. to the so Speaking from experience, I take it. Yeah, so just making sure that there's no errors, like very simple stuff. And in my experience, well, maybe I'm just staring at this stuff too much already, so I don't know. But uh, I do think that the error messages you get back from this are are useful enough to be actionable. Um, so it, it's not something that to gives you total gibberish. Um, it'll give you some line numbers and say what it found wrong. And if you're familiar enough with um, 
these common foot like common pitfalls of translation, uh, it usually nails itself down for you right away. Yeah, so we didn't get to use it today um, because of the scope of the workshop, I think, was a bit different. But in general, I think this uh, Pro Tools will already be helpful for doing translations for your own packages. Uh, the big blocker to doing it today is that, as we saw, like Base just has too many messages. So like, there's no way we're going to do it today in one shot, and in general, to do it in one shot. So uh, it's not super well equipped for doing like chunks of translation yet, um, or yeah, like picking out a certain number of, of messages to translate or focusing on a certain um, subset of messages to translate and, and working with them. So uh, yeah, use this for your own package. Uh, it has a lot of tools for um, treating your messages in your package like a database and uh, analyzing it as such, like um, diagnosing whether there's typos, you could do that. Uh, yeah, I think it's just helpful to have a mindset of considering the messages in your package as a database and Pro Tools should facilitate working with that. Okay, that's uh, that wraps up the discussion of how translations work. I think we'll take maybe what we have until another what another hour and forty five minutes, right? So uh, we'll take about fifteen minutes uh, break and just rest, stretch your legs, stretch anything you want, take a bathroom break, get some fluids. And uh, we'll come back. I'll, I'll stay here for another like couple minutes for any questions that come up, and then uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stretch myself. Is there any way to build R from source with the new Po files without all the complexity of building R? I mean, there is some kind of shortcut to. Yeah. So I was just thinking about this today, and I think you could do it. Um, by just generating that de .mo file and injecting it into where the .mo files live already. Um, I can't promise that won't break anything, but I think it would be a way to get away with not having to fully rebuild R um, and still see whether the translation shows up like you'd like. Um, if I, I think it should be relatively safe because as I understand, the, the .mo is really just a lookup step um, so if you break things, it shouldn't like cause a seg fault or anything. Like it really should just um, cause the lookup to fail, and then the regular translation gets produced. Um, so yeah, I think it in the case where your translations are actually working correctly, it can signal that it has worked correctly. I can't promise that it'll tell you that your signal whether what has failed is that your translations aren't working correctly, or that this doesn't work. <laughs> as a way to get around rebuilding R. Uh, I can't say off the top of my head whether that's true or not. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I think you're already going to be likely, if you're, if you're submitting translations that are, that are useful for us anyway, they're going to be against the latest R Devel, right? The, the later, the better, right? So ideally, you're already getting it out of uh, SVN and, and, you know, and building it. And so, well, yes, there probably are hacks and things you can get around. I think ultimately to do it the right way, um, you're, you're working on a, on a check out a bar and, and going through that complexity. But there, there is actually another yeah. workshop on how to, on how to build and, and contribute to R <laughs> tomorrow. So you can check that one out. Yeah. And for me, it's like already I have R there and once you have R and it's been made already, then the remake usually is pretty fast. So just to add translations probably would not take too long to compile, but that learning curve to get to the place where it actually makes correctly in the first place is pretty substantial. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about this morning was that, yeah, in principle, you could just git clone the um, git version of R Devel, do your translations there. I never really have to actually make R uh, in principle. Um, but yeah, with and if you're using message format correctly and like checking that the um, translations file is formatted correctly, that could get you away with not having to actually um, install R from source, I think, um, just as a way to like lower the barrier to do translations. I think that should be possible. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, did you 
share the slides or somewhere? Oh, sorry. Um, let me put that in the Slack. I meant to put that in the Slack. Oh, can I stop sharing? It will be easier to, to copy the command then. Thanks. I, let me know if the, I meant to share with you guys a long time ago, sorry. Um, let me know if I messed up any of the permissions, which is always my bugbear. Okay. Seems to work. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, it'll be slightly different for the Spanish crew and the rest, but uh, the basic idea is to do a couple of uh, translations here. Um, for Spanish, it's a little bit weird because there is existing translations, um, but for the rest, I kind of compiled a small set of uh, famous and like infamous translations that uh, maybe are the most common or most well known from R, and we can translate those uh, since they maybe are the most salient. Um, and for Spanish, uh, there are C translations, but no R translations. So you'll do like half and half of like uh, updating old translations and uh, making new translations for the R side of stuff. Um, so yeah, doing those translations is one thing. And then uh, hopefully we can get to a place uh, where we can get this ready to be patched put into R. So uh, Mike Lawrence is on our core. He's enthusiastic about the possibility for that. So. I think it's uh, something we can get to. So for the, you guys have these slides now, so I think these links will work for you. Um, for the new languages, download this file is the extract from our base, which is the R side messages. And this our common.pot is from the, the C side. So there's two files, each of them have about 50 messages in them. Um, and then uh, we will run message init to create the initial .po file. Uh, we will update the metadata to make sure it's actually in the right form and then start doing translations. For, I think there's nobody here that actually attended doing French, but um, for Spanish, so they originally were translated, I think, like 2011. So R is very old, but very stable. So a lot of the messages still work, but uh, there's, of course, been a lot of updates since then. Uh, there is no translations for the R side yet. So we can do the common translations from the R side um, and uh, just do updates for the, the C side. So on the C side, it will be um, this file which the old file is in some weird encoding. I tried to do an extract of it into UTF-8. Hopefully we don't have to spend half the time working on encoding. So hopefully this works already that this one is in, it's called to do for it's like the, the, the translations that need to be updated or um, are just new. There's about uh, maybe 300 in here of those. Uh, and here's the UTF-8 version of the .po file. Uh, so yeah, once, if we get any progress on that, uh, we'll be able to combine them with this. You know, and we'll talk more about uh, details there um, once we do the breakout. So the everybody that's working on an individual language, which is everybody but the Spanish speakers, will stay in the main room and we'll work on how to do a, a new language um, according to this. And then for the Spanish speakers, they'll be in a room um, and able to course, uh, converse with one another, figure out how they want to work. Uh, and working in a slightly different way. OK, so I will do the breakout rooms then. Mike, I was just asking to Arthur. I have one uh, question, technical question. Sure. How to do something. Can I share my screen? You should, oh, hopefully you can. Um, unfortunately, I was booted from being host, so. OK. So for is it is it too small? I don't I don't know how to make this bigger. So I'm using the pull edit, and yeah. this one here it has the like the source text is like uh, the the singular one and then the plural one. 
how do I type it in, in the translation part? Because when I press enter, it just makes the new line basically. Um. Oh, uh. This, I don't know. I think this is something from the tool that I'm, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, maybe this is. Uh, Maybe so in um, in Bahasa, I think there's only one plural. Sort of. <laughs> yeah. So I think they only maybe expect one message here. Okay. Um, yeah, it should be okay. So we call Oh, is there a mirror? Oh, they are here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so just to wrap up quickly, uh, thank you, everybody, first of all. Um, I hope you learned some stuff. Hopefully, um, this also, I guess more importantly, sets you up to be able to um, continue some work on translation in the future. Um, I know Elio and Paolo were talking about maybe doing a hackathon um, of users in uh, Argentina for to continue translation as, as a team. Um, that would obviously reduce the burden a lot to be able to divide it over 10 or 20 people. Um, so maybe the uh, Middle Eastern and Indonesian contingents as well can uh, brainstorm on how best to go about setting up such a <laughs> hackathon and not have to just put all of the translations on your shoulder. Um, for next steps, uh, you can either send me now what you have progress on or just as you have time um, to work on it, send me what you can come up with. Um, the, what I would want is the .po file that comes from your language. Um, and at the top, there's um, a metadata field. So if you scroll to the very top of the .po file, there should be something about uh, metadata you should write your name as like the last translator um, and yeah, make sure things are up to date there. There's one field about the encoding that says either Caraset or it says UTF-8 there. Um, and I think that's basically it. Uh, try and test out with the command I left in the slides about MSG FMT to check that the, uh, the file is in the right order. Um, and, and syntactically doing okay. Um, and yeah, of course, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you're stuck anywhere, I'll, I'll help uh, going forward as well. Um, I think that's it, yeah, so send me the .po file uh, over email or um, zipped up and sent over email to try and, uh, if you zip it up, it helps remove any issues from encoding that can happen. Um, when you send over email. So yeah, just send to me. I sent the email in the, the Slack channel. Um, and uh, enjoy the rest of Usar. Thank you.